There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'll just start out by giving a little bit of background. Um, my name is Ladar Levison, and I was the owner and still am the owner operator of LavaBit, an email service that hopefully one day will be able to um, stand on its own without any references to Snowden. Um, I, I thought it was great. There's a, there was a time right after the shutdown when my lawyer was talking to the press and he didn't say the word lava bit when asked who he was working for. He said Snowden's email provider and I had to explain to him that you're not working for Snowden or Snowden's email provider, you're working for lava bit. Um, so hopefully one day I'll step out from that shadow and let the issue that I'm fighting for stand on its own, and that is the right to privacy. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, it's actually only been in the news about a week now, um, because I've only been able to disclose it for about that long. Uh, precisely what I'm fighting for in court is the right to protect a company's SSL keys. Um, for those of you who don't know, SSL is the little lock icon in your browser that protects your e-commerce transactions. It's a core cryptographic technology or protocol that really protects communications on the internet and establishes trust in a person's identity. Quite simply, you encrypt something with somebody's public key and you know that only that company, or at least in theory, only that company can decrypt it. Um, it guarantees that when you send your username and password, for example, to your bank, that only your bank can decrypt that information. And effectively what was going on is the FBI wanted to usurp my online identity, usurp my, my private key, and use it to masquerade as my business on the internet and intercept all of the communications coming in and out of my network. And of course, I wasn't comfortable with that. <laughs> to say the least. Um, more disturbing was the fact that I couldn't even tell anybody that it was going on. How do you have a debate? How do you discuss something publicly when nobody even knows that a particular law exists or that it's being applied in a certain way? Um, so that's quite simply my fight. Um, we filed our brief in the appeal last week. So now we sit back and we wait for a ruling and hope that you know, it will be favorable. Um, when I first started LavaBit 10 years ago, I thought the United States would be the perfect country for it. After all, we are, you know, the, the home of the brave and the land of the free. Um, our Constitution is supposed to protect freedom at its most basic level. And as it turns out, I probably picked the worst, if not the second worst country on the planet for hosting the service, um, China being the other one. Um, but rather than pack up my bags and head to Europe, I decided that as an American, it would be important for me to stay and try and fight, to try and change the laws that I disagreed with. So like I said, I'm sitting and waiting. If I win my, my battle in court, I'll reopen Lava Bit and business will continue. And if I lose, I'll probably have to turn over my business to somebody in Europe who can run it for me um, or in my place. And I'll go off and be a farmer or something like that. Um, what we have here um, today is a debate on to what lengths a government and its law enforcement officers should be allowed to go when it comes to conducting investigations. It's the simple question of surveillance versus privacy. And a lot of people have accused me of being anti-government because I was anti-surveillance. And that's simply not true. I'm not anti-government. I'm simply pro-freedom. Think about that. I believe in the rule of law. I believe in the need to conduct investigations. But those investigations are supposed to be difficult for a reason. It's supposed to be difficult to invade somebody's privacy because of how intrusive it is, because of how disruptive it is. If we can't, if we don't have our right to privacy, how do we have a free and open discussion? What good is the right to free speech if it's not protected? In the sense that you can't have a private discussion with somebody else about something you disagree with. Think about the chilling effect that that has. 
think about the chilling effect it does have on countries that don't have a right to privacy. It's one thing for us to give up our rights, but what we're guaranteed is the ability to talk about the rights that we've lost in the hopes of regaining them. And if we can't have that discussion, we'll never be able to regain any of the freedoms that we may have given up. So that's why I take such an ardent view of how important it is to protect the right to privacy. And that's why I developed the service that I did. Quite simply, LavaBit was designed to remove the service provider from the equation. By not having logs on my server and not having access to a person's emails on disk, I wasn't eliminating the possibility of surveillance. I was simply removing myself from that equation in that surveillance would have to be conducted on the target, either the sender or the receiver of the messages. We have a, a very important case in our history over in the United States, it's Smith v. Maryland. I learned about it myself quite recently, but basically what it says is that any information you trust to a service provider is no longer protected. All of the meta information associated with a phone call or an email information is no longer protected. And effectively what it means is that if you want to have a communication, if you want to communicate with anybody electronically, that that discussion is not protected. Because you're entrusting a service provider out there in the cloud, in the ether, with those communications. And it shouldn't be that way. Simply using a service shouldn't mean giving up your rights to privacy. And that's what my service was designed to do. It was to remove me from the possibility of being forced to violate a person's privacy. Now, I lived happily for about 10 years until recently, at which point I was approached and, and told that because I couldn't turn over the information, I would be forced to give up those SSL keys and let the FBI collect it themselves. And again, I tried to cooperate. I tried to provide the modify my system to provide the information myself for that one particular user. And the government's response was, well, we want it in real time. You mean you want to be able to log into a device on my network and change the collection parameters in real time without anybody knowing? They didn't have an answer to that. When I offered to let them put the device on my network, but stipulated that I'd be able to audit it, that I'd be able to configure it with them, and that I would hold 10 characters of the password and that they would hold 10 characters of the password so that we'd know that this device was only collecting the information they were legally authorized to collect, they declined as well. Effectively, what they wanted was unfettered access to every communication on my network without any kind of transparency. And that was simply a situation I couldn't live with, something I wasn't comfortable with. In fact, it was such a disturbing prospect that I was having trouble sleeping. So finally, I decided, quite simply, if I didn't win the fight to unseal my case, if I didn't win the battle to be able to tell people what was going on, then my only ethical choice left was to shut down. Now, I didn't expect anybody to even notice my shutdown, sans the 400,000 or so people who were using my service. Maybe a little bit of coverage in the tech blogs. But if one thing the summer of Snowden has done for all of us, it's focused the debate on privacy. And as a result, I got a lot more coverage than, than I expected. It's part of the reason I'm here today. It's because the people on this, on this dais, the people out in the audience, heard about what was going on and they wanted to hear more. But the discussion doesn't mean anything if it doesn't lead to action. So while my lawyers can win the battle for SSL keys, there's a larger debate about whether or not service providers can be forced to give up passwords, encryption keys, source code, their intellectual property, their crown jewels, just to aid in an investigation. Or if that the burden should fall back on the investigators. Like I said, surveillance isn't supposed to be easy. 
it's supposed to be difficult. And what's happening is the methods that are being employed are creating effectively an arms race, forcing people who want to have private conversations to develop better and better ways of communicating, more and more secure ways. And unfortunately, what's the, what that means is that both the citizen and the criminal are, be, are using the same method of communication. And that secure method of communication is becoming harder and harder to decipher for law enforcement. And it's a prospect that effectively is being brought on by themselves. And it's unfortunate, but it's a reality. And I think I'll leave it at that.